Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month explore, explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will hear about the partnerships between the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, Seed Savers Exchange, and the Meskwaki Nation, and what the cultivation of old lifeways means to each of them. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Byer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Daniel Maher. Dan is a professor of anthropology and sociology at the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, where he has taught since 1997. He is the coordinator of the diversity studies minor at the university and teaches a range of anthropology, sociology, and diverse study courses. His publications include a monograph with the University of Florida Press in 2016 titled Mythic Frontiers, Remembering, Forgetting, and Profiting with Cultural Heritage Tourism, and a 2021 article with the Annals of Iowa titled Crafting Norwegian American Identity and Inclusion in Decorah's Vesterheim Museum. This presentation is part of a larger book project that he is working on with the working title of Mythic Pioneers of the Tall Grass Prairie, From Wilderness to Wilder and Back. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Dan to begin the webinar. Let's see, I'm trying to get the first slide to advance. Here we go. Jennifer, okay, there we go. It did advance, sorry about that. So thank you for the invitation to share this portion of my research with you, decolonizing seeds to revitalize lifeways, regeneration through tall grass prairie and American bison, heirloom seeds and food sovereignty. Thank you all for being here today. I'd like to begin by letting you know that trauma and intergenerational trauma, domestic violence and violence against indigenous women will be briefly discussed about 30 minutes into this presentation. This is as much a reminder for me as it is an indication for you. I know that it's in this presentation and it still takes me aback. <clears throat> I'd also like to address where I'm speaking to you from today. The History, Social Sciences, Philosophy Department of the University of Arkansas, Fort Smith in the University of Arkansas system acknowledges that the spaces in which we offer our services were previously inhabited by sovereign nations, nations for time immemorial. The Mississippian civilization's political hub, Spyro, was in the region from 800 to 1300. The Caddo, Osage, Quapaw followed. The 1830 Indian Removal Act forced the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Muscogee and Seminole into the region, as well as these five nations' African-descended slaves, known today as the freedmen. As representatives of an educational institution and academic disciplines that have benefited from stolen land and forced labor and created ideologies that reinforced inequalities, we pledged to decolonize our curriculum and to amplify voices previously silenced in our teaching, service, and research practices. We seek to partner with these still-living sovereign nations uh, to elevate their sacred legacies and their shared presence in the region and to create an indigenous friendly community within the history of social sciences philosophy department. So I also want to acknowledge that this particular segment of my book project is being partially funded by State Historical Society of Iowa Research Grant. I'm very appreciative of that support and my timeline for the projects on the screen. Um, this presentation will consist of about a 25 minute setup of the, the general perspective, and it will be followed by some very specific uh, examples. One other note about the presentation, uh, all the photos were taken by me except were noted. 
This project emerged as a follow-up to my research on frontier spaces that culminated in my book, Mythic Frontiers, Remembering, Forgetting, and Profiting with Cultural Heritage Tourism. In that project, I looked at the variety of voices articulating a relationship to frontier space. Shifting to pioneer spaces seemed to be the next logical path to follow. This was aided in many medit meditative hours of driving through Iowa from Arkansas to visit family in Illinois. Fundamentally, my question is, how do people relate to the land? Whether you are an indigenous people, an agricultural pioneer, an heirloom seed company, a communistic religious sect, a post-industrial agri-corporation creating genetically modified seeds, or practitioners of transcendental meditation, your answer to that question is going to be different. Likewise, if you are a coneflower, or a big blue stem, or squash seed, or an American bison, your answer to that question is going to be different. The unique relationships these different communities of people, plants, animals, and organizations have with the land is communicated in the stories they tell of why they are there. This is why I want to an what I want to analyze the stories we tell to explain, justify, and legitimate our relationship to the land, to the pioneer space, to the space that was covered by the pre-colonial tall grass prairie ecosystem of Iowa in particular, in short, how do we imagine, how do we dream of our present, past, and future relationship to each other and the land on which we live? What follows are partial answers to these questions. And for those of you who like a thesis statement, here is mine. Dispossessed communities have returned to land and foodways rooted in pre-colonial and pre-corporate America as an act of resistance against the impact colonization and corporatization have had on land, food, and peoples. As you can see from this slide, there are many voices within my research area of the pre-colonial Tallgrass Prairie of Iowa. I think these voices sort out into two large categories. There are communities that are remembering the past, reaching back into the past for guidance, for charting a course through the future. Then there are communities that are reaching into cutting edge scientific knowledge to chart a course through the future. For this research grant and presentation, I will focus primarily on three of these communities, the Meskwaki Nation, Seed Savers Exchange, and the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, all of which I have located in the category of remembering the past. A brief mention will be made of communities remembering the future at the end of this presentation. So some of these sites are plotted on this Google map to give you a quick orientation of their locations. The three discussed uh, here have red circles indicating their location. Uh, at the bottom left center is the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge in red. Just to the left west of it in blue is Des Moines. Northeast of Des Moines is the Meskwaki Settlement in red. And then in the far northeast corner of the state is Decorah, with uh, Seed Savers Exchange Heritage Farm is in red, with a blue mark adjacent above it for the Lower Ingalls Wilder site in Baroque and adjacent below it for the Vesterheim Museum in Decorah. So this is a slightly large uh, fieldwork site for a cultural anthropologist, I realize this, <laughs> but all these sites are within the historical boundaries of the Tallgrass Prairie, and they all represent different voices in this pioneer space. To zoom into our focus here, we need to understand each of the three communities independently and then examine how they have recently become allies in revitalizing the past. Here in this slide are some basic dates for the Meskwaki Nation Seed Savers and the Neil Smith uh, Refuge. So we will return to this exact slide uh, momentarily. Let's see, there we go. Before we do, we need to recognize that these specific examples in Iowa are part of national and global trends. The notion of food sovereignty, for example, grew out of an international perspective first articulated by La Via Campesina in 1993 that focused on poor agricultural workers' rights. Food sovereignty was used at the 1996 World Food Summit and by 2014 uh, was in widespread usage and practice. The heirloom seed movement squarely emerges in the turbulent times and environmental awareness that arose in the US in the 1960s from Silent Spring, the Population Bomb, Mother Earth News, Earth Day, the Vietnam War, and uh, the Back to the Lander movements. The preservation of tall grass prairies and American bison existed for decades and picked up particular steam in the 1990s. 
Today, the Iowa Prairie Network has identified over 200 designated prairies in the state. Likewise, we can see several examples of a similar impulse of remembering the past to return to or preserve former lifeways. When a lifeway is threatened, when it is taken away, when individuals and communities lose their vitality, the response is often what Anthony Wallace called a revitalization movement. I believe we can locate all three communities we are focused on here today within this human response to tragic and despondent conditions. In all these cases on the screen, there is a concerted resistance to larger structural forces and a shift in life ways to recover from the destabilizing forces and consequences of industrialization, corporatization, and colonization. So that was a very quick, very wide angle view of our topic for today. Uh, so to refocus, here are the three communities that we will now examine one at a time and then look into how they have become allies over the past 17 years. In 1975, Back to the Lander publications, Mother Earth News and Landward Ho ran a notice that declared, quote, I have a plan for forming the true seed, ex true seed exchange. If uh, you've been gardening for a few years and are keeping seeds that you know from your own personal experience run true, send me your name and address and what kinds of seeds you'll have, unquote. With this request of gardeners to share their heirloom seeds, Ken Wheelie and Diane Ott Wheelie launched what would become Seed Savers Exchange. This initial letter articulated the values behind the plan, quote, if this works the way I imagine it, the true seed exchange should help a lot of people save a lot of money, especially considering the way uh, seed prices are going. It'll also help to spread a lot of old reliable varieties that might otherwise be lost and will give all of us seeds to save from year to year, which is economical now and may soon be downright vital, unquote. From the outset, the values driving this organization were focused on affordable, accessible, sustainable, and diverse food ways. You can see on the slide key dates and driving ideas of the movement. The name of the organization reflects the very manner in which the seed sharing process works. It is a collective shared effort by gardeners across the country to conduct participatory preservation by exchanging seeds and their stories with others. The wheelies were inspired to begin seed savers out of a felt concern that the biological and cultural heritage contained in the seeds were being lost. As is declared on their website, we built a movement, not a seed company. Since 1975, we have been working hard to keep heirloom varieties where they belong, in our gardens, in, on our tables, and in our hearts. Today, they boast a seed bank that contains over 20,000 open pollinated varieties. There are two distinct and intertwined values that drive the heirloom seed movement. One is the focus on maintaining biodiversity. The second is on maintaining generational cultural heritage food ways. Heirloom seed adherents privilege their types of seeds over genetically engineered variants. The so-called GMOs are created using laboratory technology such as gene splicing. The resulting plants from these seeds are artificially created, not naturally selected through the process of open pollination. Ordinary citizens cannot develop GMO seeds. They are by their very design patented products of agricultural corporations. As such, they are deemed unsustainable by the heirloom seed community because they are proprietary patents of a corporation. They do not belong to an individual or cultural community. GMO seeds are typically planted in mass quantities of monocrop acres. Heirloom seed advocates favor a, a permaculture process designed for ecological diversity. Large letters above the door to the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge Auditorium invite speakers to return to wildness. The surrounding 6,000 acres covered in prairie plant species, elk, and American bison invoke a premature impression this has been accomplished. A few short decades ago, the land now covered by this halcyonic scene had a different fate in store. In the 1970s, the Iowa Power and Light Company had planned to turn this space into a nuclear power plant. Thousands of acres were purchased with that intention from local farmers who had been practicing industrial agriculture on it for decades. When the proposed nuclear plant became unfeasible, the U.S. Congressman from Iowa, Neil Smith, quickly learned of the land's availability and worked to appropriate funds to turn the space into a wildlife refuge. 
As Smith stated in a 2019 interview with Iowa Public Radio, his motivation as a conservationist was the dearth of public land within the state. According to Smith, quote, Iowa had the least public lands of any state in the union, unquote. First named the Walnut Creek National Wildlife Refuge in 1990, it was rechristened with Smith's name in 1998. Technically, the refuge is a restoration project. It contains a patchwork of 90 cumulative acres of such prairie remnants that serve as a seed source for restoring other acres. As the crow flies, the refuge is 17 miles east of the gold-domed state capital in Des Moines. Google map results indicate that just over half an hour's drive can transport you from the urban center to the tall grass prairie and bison restoration project. And the mission of the refuge is to, quote, protect, restore, reconstruct, and manage the diverse native communities of tall grass prairie, sedge meadow, and aquatic ecosystems, and the natural process essential to these ecosystems to enhance the vitality and health of the native prairie environment, unquote. Acreage has gradually been added to the original 3,600, and American bison and elk have been reintroduced. The bison herd got its start in October 1996 with eight bison, four bulls, and four cows. The elk followed shortly after in February 1997 with four bulls. The established bison and elk herds freely roam within an 800-acre enclosure. The carrying capacity for the bison population is 45 to 50, uh, and the elk 15 to 20. Though small in number, these large keystone animals are a big draw for many visitors. Tiny seeds may not grab the headlines, but they are the focus of any tall grass prairie restoration. The hard, meticulous work is necessary for reconstructing the habitat for all creatures, great and small, from bison to butterflies. Finding tall grass prairie seed that meet the criteria for, for being native to the region is no small task. Quote, the refuge only uses local ecotype seed, which is seed taken from plants found within the 38 surrounding counties, unquote. This process requires year-round attention to maximize collection efforts. The refuge has planted over 200 species on its reconstructed uh, acres. There are many moving parts to reconstituting the diverse ecosystem of tall grass prairie. As William Cronin demonstrated in his classic environmental history text, uh, Nature's Metropolis, 19th century Iowa served as a hinterland to feed the growing urban spaces. Industrial and post-industrial agriculture, the very bread and butter of Iowa's economy, literally destroyed the vast majority of its tall grass prairie ecosystem to feed America and beyond. This map shows the boundaries of the pre-colonial tall grass prairie. The most generous estimate is that only 4% of it remains. The Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi, also known as the Meskwaki, have a long history in North America. As distinct bands, the Sac and Fox have their roots in the St. Lawrence River Valley, dating back to the early 1700s. As England, France, and then the United States expanded dominion over the land, the Sac and Fox traveled westward by force or flee with many other indigenous peoples. The Black Hawk War of 1832 cemented an alliance between these two bands, creating a confederacy. After their defeat, they were formally banished by the U.S. government to a reservation on Kansas. Some Meskwaki resisted forced migration from the out outset, remaining in Iowa. Others later backtracked to Iowa. The outright purchase of land by the Meskwaki in 1857 for an independent settlement created a unique relationship to state and federal governments compared to that of many Indian nations. As the Meskwaki note, quote, because their ancestors had the tenacity and foresight to purchase their land, the Meskwaki settlement is not an Indian reservation. It was not set apart from the public domain and reserved for Indians. It is privately purchased uh, property, a sovereign nation, unquote. The mission statement of the Meskwaki nation is to rely on knowledge and experiences of the past, along with the will to survive to advance the people, culture, and well-being of the Meskwaki nation, unquote. Of the three communities featured in this presentation, the Meskwaki are qualitatively different in that it is a people, not a plant or an animal, that is striving to be revitalized. That is a substantial difference from planting heirloom seeds or big blue stem. Indigenous peoples have long sought to revitalize their life ways through food ways from the Seneca of the 1700s to the Meskwaki today. 
The Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative's mission is, quote, to secure food sovereignty by seeding, growing, and harvesting Meskwaki indigenous knowledge and lifeways, unquote. Red Earth Garden was created in 2013 as a means to this end. It, quote, is an organic farm committed to growing food in a way that was taught to us by our ancestors, nourishing Mother Earth while supporting the community through environmentally sustainable practices. We grow vegetables, herbs, flowers, and fruit, unquote. By 2022, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Programs were nationally featured as models for others to follow. On April 6, 2022, Washington Post headline, for example, declared, quote, can the indigenous hashtag land back movement secure self-determination? History from Iowa suggests that it can, unquote. The National Resources Defense Council featured Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiatives in 2021. In the article, Shelley Buffalo reflects on how food sovereignty is not just about eating food. Quote, my identity is Meskwaki, says Buffalo. So cutting those foods, growing, I'm sorry, so eating those foods, growing those foods, keeping that seed has just done such a tremendous amount of healing for me personally, unquote. A life way is being revitalized as the seeds the Meskwaki consume are decolonized. In 2006, the Meskwaki revived another ancient life way with the creation of a 155 acre prairie grazed by a small bison herd. In 2022, the herd ranged from 45 to 55 in number with a total of 205 acres. Quote, the buffalo play a strong cultural role within the Meskwaki lifestyle. They are here to complete the Meskwaki way of life and they are not feedlot animals, but are treated as wildlife, unquote. Some of the bison that arrived in 2006 were transferred from the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. Similarly, in 2018, the Meskwaki began a partnership with Seed Savers Exchange to arrange for the rematriation of seeds from Seed Savers back to the Meskwaki that took place a few years later. These remarkable partnerships will be explored next. So all three communities uh, here are remembering the past, revitalizing past life ways, and asserting them in the present moment as acts of resistance against larger forces that are identified by them as the source of oppression and destruction. Value systems wrapped around past traditions, ecologies, and cultures are different but similar enough to bring these communities together as allies in partnerships of reciprocity. Much of the specific data we will look at next was born out of the pandemic. COVID-19 interrupted all of our travel plans. I withdrew a sabbatical application when I saw my field work would not be possible. Uh, but the COVID shove, as they call it, led to more conversations taking place online and being recorded and being made available online. As a result, I was given greater access to conversations than I would have otherwise. Uh, the webinar, webinar series you see on the screen here will be key references in the next slides. The return of American bison to the Meskwaki began with the partnership with the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. You can see here on the slide some quotes from the Meskwaki Nation website and how they distribute meat from their bison herd. The profundity of this reclamation of bison as a lifeway cannot be overstated. In the 19th century, the decimation of the American bison was a strategy deployed by the U.S. government to sequester indigenous peoples on reservations. The near destruction of the species, down to less than 1,000 in 1890, is a literal and palpable image of the oppression faced by indigenous people. The late 19th century also witnessed the prophecy of Wavoka and the promise of the ghost dance ritual, which would transcend colonization and revitalize the buffalo. It also saw the massacre of unarmed men, women, and children at Wounded Knee. To resist, to remain strong and courageous against such forces for centuries, to flourish today as a people, and to reclaim a lifeway that includes American bison herds is indeed profound. <clears throat> So while the cultural significance of returning buffalo to the Meskwaki is clear, what it means to the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge is different. As scientists seeking to revive an ecosystem and as part of a much larger bureaucratic government agency, the specific word transfer is used to describe the act of sending a bison from the refuge to indigenous nations. I ask specific, specifically about this 
I wondered if maybe the word repatriate was used since rematriate is used with dis when discussing seed sovereignty. I was told no, that the technical word of transfer would suffice. While the Meskwaki and the Neil Smith Refuge share the values of revitalizing past life ways, the specific ways in which those are expressed are substantially different. Regardless, such alliances are powerful. Uh, in another example, which you may have heard about, uh, in April 2021, NPR ran an article about the city of Denver returning bison to 14 Indian nations. Uh, it amplified the cultural sig significance of the act. Uh, Denver Mayor Michael Hancock said, quote, we get a chance to apologize, acknowledge the challenges of the past, and to forge a relationship going forward. At Seed Savers, there was a direct homage to Indigenous nations regarding the adoption of the word rematriation over repatriation when talking about returning seeds. As Sarah Strait put it, in the fall of 2018, we sent seeds of squash back to the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico, where they held a rematriation ceremony. You're more familiar with the word repatriation, which is returning something back to where it came from. In indigenous communities, the women were often the gardeners and the seed caretakers. So we have adjusted the word from repatriation to rematriation as a way to honor and reflect that tradition. At this point in my research, I have far more data on seed rematriation than I do on exchange of bison. This may be due to the fact that it is much easier to plant a garden than it is to manage a bison herd of large wild animals weighing hundreds of pounds. Far more people are directly involved with small seeds. Women, though not exclusively, are particularly featured in this domain, making rematriate far more accurate descriptor over repatriate. <clears throat> a notable exception is the award-winning and nationally recognized chef, Sean Sherman, the Sioux chef, as he calls himself, who made Time Magazine's top 100 most influential people of 2023, and who also serves on the board of Seed Savers Exchange. The Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance was created in 2014, and the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network is a program within it. Rowan White is from the Mohawk community of the Aquasasne. She was a founder of the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and was Seed Savers Exchange board chair in 2017. With a literal foot in each community, Miss White saw the natural collaboration that could take place given the shared values of the Seed Keeper Network and Seed Savers. The range of entities involved in establishing this relationship reflects its significance. The North Central Sustainable Agricultural Research Education Program, which is funded by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, gave Seed Savers Exchange a grant to facilitate seed rematriation to indigenous peoples. This complicated alphabet soup of agencies was necessarily aligned to authenticate and legitimate the simple act of passing seeds from one hand to the next. The process of growing out seeds and then saving enough to rematriate to indigenous nations took a few years. In 2020, Seed Savers Exchange rematriated seeds into the hands of three indigenous farmers, Jessica Greendeer of the Ho-Chunk, Rebecca Webster of the Oneida Nation, and Shelly Buffalo representing the Meskwaki Nation. Rebecca Webster reflected that, quote, the idea of indigenous food sovereignty to us, it's a way to reconnect with our identity. It's a way to reassert ourselves. It's a way to reclaim what we are. And it's a way to let everybody know we're still here, unquote. The universality of humans surviving via seeds was spoken to by Miss Buffalo, quote, with seeds, there is no language barrier. When you grow them out, tend to them and complete the circle of keeping the new seeds, you are connected through that process to your grandmothers going back thousands of years. That is their universal language, unquote. This act of reciprocity between the heirloom seed community and the food sovereignty community allowed each to manifest their mission, vision, and values. The partnership between Seed Savers and the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network facilitated a great deal of conversation and public discussion on the meaning of seed rematriation to Indigenous peoples, what this meant to Seed Savers Exchange is equally important to look at, quote, the idea of rematriation is to bring seeds back to communities, indigenous communities that do not have them or lost them. The mission of Seed Savers Exchange is to not only preserve the varieties and the diversity, but also to share. And so when we found these indigenous varieties in the collection with the intent of bringing them and sharing them back with indigenous communities, it just fits our mission perfectly. 
as you can see there on the screen uh, from Philip Koth. So I want to now share with you some small samples of indigenous people speaking about what food sovereignty means to them, and most importantly, let you hear about it in their own voices. And I hope this next video will play. What is a seed? Our past, our present, and our future. Our ancestors, our future generations. Knowledge and cosmic understanding. We are humbled by the seeds. Seeds are what sustain me and my family. The seeds of my ancestors. Seeds are our children. They're creation's children. Seeds are our culture, our heritage. Our past, our history, and our health. It's in our DNA, it's in our spirit that we know this. We need to unite as a Native community to protect the seeds. We're developing a network of seed stewards, seed keepers, seed growers. Resources and wisdom together in a big circle. Teaching, instructing. Having seed exchanges. It's not only growing good seeds and creating access for them, but it's growing good seed stewards. Multi-generational activities, carrying on our heritage. Be self-reliant and self-sufficient. Nourish those seeds and get them back on the table and into people's lives. It's all about food, right? You exploit what you merely value, but you defend what you love. And part of the seed sovereignty movement is remembering to love our seeds because they are our relatives. The seed movement is not just the responsibility of the farmers or gardeners in our communities, but it's everyone's responsibility. To decide what is being planted, where it's being planted, and by whom it's being harvested and gathered and cooked. From seed to seed, just as our ancestors cared for them. Corporations want to come in and buy the rights to our homeland's ability to make and keep life. Nobody owns these seeds. Those seeds are life. We are who our ancestors dreamed of. We need to be the ancestors to our future generations. So that uh, video um, was from Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. This is on the screen is a few choice quotes from that. This was my backup plan in the case of the, uh, the video not working, <clears throat> but I will move on here. Uh, so I want to begin with um, some, some quotes from specific people. So here's a, a quote from Jessica Greendeer um, about the seed rematriation that um, that worked with seed savers. I'm incredibly grateful for the relationship uh, between the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and Seed Savers Exchange. It helped me reconnect with other parts of my culture. Um, and that's what I think is so beautiful about the seed work. It's not just about growing seeds. You know, anybody can put a seed in the ground, but it's about cultivating the relationship and the whole history of that seed and why our ancestors did everything they could to protect them. Next is Rebecca Webster of the United Nation. Is that every time an indigenous person plants a seed that is an act of resistance, an assertion of sovereignty, and a reclamation of identity, 
and rematriating these seeds back to us so that we can grow and care for them and then turn around and, and give them to our community is a huge step in being able to make this happen. Here is uh, Shelly Buffalo of the Meskwaki Nation. Once we become aware of them, you know, like they're out there and they want to be, they want to be back with us. They want to be back. They want to renew that relationship with us just as much as we want that relationship renewed with them. And then here's another quote from Jessica Green Deer. Um, it's not just about the energy coming, um, the feminine energy coming behind to sort of pick up those pieces of our culture, whether that's part of our foods, the stories that go uh, into different ceremonies, or maybe it's different objects that we have cultural significance to. Rematriation to me is like the culmination of all of those coming back together as we continue to strengthen our cultures, you know, not only within my tribe, but also with other tribes across Turtle Island or North America. Um, and I think it's a beautiful revitalization of being able to make those connections again and re-strengthen our culture. And So this is just a small sample of voices, but there are a set of words used frequently in these discussions. This list on the screen is a set of powerful transformational processes, restoring, reconciling, reclaiming, regenerating, revitalizing, resisting, decolonizing, decorporatizing, and perhaps most overarching of all, healing. The intergenerational trauma and individuals' uh, experiences of trauma were ma are manifestly noted when you listen to these hours of conversation of what it means to plant these seeds. To be clear, uh, what I mean by that is that there are a lot of shared tears as these women speak of reuniting with these seeds. There's a great emotional outpouring. I want to next focus specifically on the Meskwaki with a few more notes from Shelley Buffalo that speak directly to intergenerational trauma and violence against indigenous women. I was just so grateful um, for those seeds to help me to access my own language and culture, right? And overcome the barriers of, of generational trauma, which was preventing that access, even for, you know, our Meskwaki ways this, that was right before my face. So it's, it's incredibly powerful. And I kind of, I want to loop that back into um, these, the seed rematriation, these seeds, are our relatives, like our Meskwaki seeds, you know, our last webinar, Luke talked about it. These are our relatives. So just to pick up on that before advancing, um, the, the fact that she says these are our ancestors, this is akin to what Wavoka prophesied in the late 19th century, what would happen with the performance of the ghost dance ritual. The deceased answers, ancestors would return as would the decimated bison herds. Rematriation is an act of restoration, as in to rematriate our ancestral seeds. Rematriation is also a state of being when we come into knowing Indigenous women's knowledge and power, which, like our seeds, have been waiting for us to return to. My experience of rematriation feels like finally coming into my womanhood and out of a state of subordination and objectification. The relationship of Indigenous people, such as the Meskwaki, to the United States government is well documented. What is often not emphasized is the gendered impact U.S. policies and practices had on Indigenous peoples. Many were horticultural people that granted land access via a usufruct rule of matrilineal clan membership. Women frequently were not only the caretakers of the seeds and the cultivators of the gardens and the fields, they controlled the access to that means of production of food, which is to say, access to the source of life. <clears throat> Colonial processes worked to dismantle matrifocal social structures for centuries. The Dawes Act of 1887 intentionally severed that clan connection to land and imposed individual private property. This is a great loss of vitality to many indigenous peoples. 
We must also speak about the significant acts of violence against indigenous women in this process, not to mention the intergenerational trauma caused by so many Indian boarding school experiences. From the past through today, indigenous women have experienced significantly higher rates of sexual assault and violence against them uh, compared to other groups of women. The Meskwaki are cognizant of this history and it makes the return of their ancestor seeds all the more powerful. Food sovereignty is a vehicle to revitalize ancient life ways, to decolonize, and to work through some of that trauma. Here's some data to give you an idea of the extent of the assault on indigenous women. This has been widely known for decades, if not centuries. When it comes to domestic violence and violence against women, there seems to be a collective amnesia that actively suppresses collective action against it. At, the, at Meskwaki Anaki, you can see evidence of this tragic state of affairs. Uh, if you cannot make out the graffiti on the, the actual graffiti, I have the, uh, what's written on it uh, below the picture there. Um, and these are, are pictures from uh, Meskwaki Anaki, the Meskwaki uh, settlement. Here are just a few of the many resources in place to combat violence against indigenous women. An internet search will give you a great many results, which is testimony to how rampant the problem is. From there, there is no good way to segue back to the research project at hand. By way of effort to do so, I will remind you of what Judith Butler spoke of as a, quote, prediscursive libidinal multiplicity what I like to call the world before words. The visual aid for that is a blank slide. In the world before words, there are infinite possibilities. The alliances between the Meskwaki Nation and the Neil Smith Refuge and between the Meskwaki Nation and Seed Savers are evidence of this agency we have in shaping our world. So here we are again, we have three communities, each with their own distinct value systems, yet overlapping in ways of decolonizing and or decorporatizing the land, the plants, animals, and entire peoples in order to revitalize life ways. These are remarkable partnerships. In addition to this, I'm also keenly aware that the earth now has over 8 billion people living on it, the vast majority of whom do not know how to grow a garden or how to make their own bread or how to kill and process an animal for consumption. Interestingly, Seed Savers Exchange, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiatives, as well as Archer Daniels Midland Corporation, each lay claim to the word sustainability. ADM says on their homepage, for example, quote, at ADM, sustainability is our nature. Learn more about how our sustainability efforts can give you an edge in meeting consumer expectations, unquote. One of the variables in these differing approaches and relationships to the land is one of scale. Are we feeding one family some vegetables from a backyard garden or a small community with 1,500 members or a country with well over 1 billion people such as India or China? In 1970, the world population was 3.6 billion when Norman Borlaug, also from Iowa, won the Nobel Peace Prize for creating a hybrid of wheat that was resistant to stem rust, ending the famine of millions in India. He warned at that time that his so-called green revolution was no permanent fix. Without curbing population growth, we would be in continuous struggle to squeeze more calories from the land with new technologies. Today, the Norman Borlaug World Food Price Foundation, ADM, Monsanto, and GMO agri-corporations are often vilified because of the approach they take to their relationship to seeds and land. Speaking pragmatically, I think it is safe to say that if those entities disappeared today, the immediate result would be billions of people in famine, a global humanitarian crisis. There are indeed many voices in the single ecosystem of the tall grass prairie, that diversity of voices, of ways of understanding our relationship to the land, all of them, will most likely be necessary to sort out a sustainable path forward. 
I realized full well that the Green Revolution marked a qualitative break in the kinds of seeds we plant. Borlaug's resistant wheat seeds required significant increases in irrigating and fertilizing that strain small-scale farmers and the environment alike. Since 1970, agricultural science has learned a few things about imagining a more sustainable future for people and for the environment. The Norman Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture and Development at Texas A&M funds projects that attempt to redress inequities in areas including food insecurity, climate change, gender inequities, and clean drinking water. Measuring what seeds are good and which seeds are bad is far more complicated than binary arguments imply. Ultimately, all the seeds we plant for consumption, both GMOs and heirlooms, are the result of humans practicing artificial selection. They are not the result of the wild forces of natural selection. As is stated on this display from the State Historical Society of Iowa Museum, quote, human choices and natural processes change the land to reflect each generation's technology and values, unquote. For some communities, heirloom seeds, tall grass prairie restorations, and food sovereignty initiatives offer a space of refuge from the deleterious effects of colonization and corporatization. These spaces of resistance offer an alternative life way, revitalizing the worldviews of their adherents. Other communities dream of a different future. One thing for certain is that the ancient tall grass prairie ecosystem of Iowa is unambiguously the source of a great diversity of perspectives. The state motto aptly describes it as fields of opportunities. Thank you for the opportunity to share this part of my research with you all. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to, to entertain them. Oh, well, thank you, Dan. We do have time to answer some questions. If you do have a question, uh, please submit it through the Q&A feature here on Zoom. And as always, please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. But I like the question to start off with is for yourself, Dan, how did you become interested in researching this topic? All right. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as I kind of mentioned in the setup, I uh, my, my dissertation and then my book, Mythic Frontiers, was right here in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is on the border with Oklahoma, which was Indian Territory. And so uh, for all that research, my head was in frontier spaces and how, do, how did people imagine this frontier space to be and, and got at the contesting points of view because in Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, from the, the, the white pioneer perspective, uh, Indian Territory was thought of quite differently than say the Cherokee or the Choctaw and so on. And so uh, when I saw that, when I realized those, those contesting points of view, that fascinated me and I wanted to understand that and explain that. Um, and so it really truly is just a logical next step. Um, you know, if you go back to uh, the frontier thesis, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, was that his name? Um, this name slipped in my mind for some reason, Turner's Frontier Thesis, um, right? We have the frontier space and then what follows are the pioneers. And, and so right when I was processing that and kind of transitioning to the next project, I was driving through Iowa quite a bit to see family and like driving by Des Moines and then seeing the Neil Smith Refuge and uh, Prairie Learning Center. I was like, what is that? And so um, it, it, I literally just drove into my uh, next field work site and, and uh, in my visits to Decora and Seed Savers well before any of these projects planted those kind of connections in my mind. So, um, and, then, and then when the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiatives got on my radar and then the interplay, it was, it's just fascinating to me. I, I just had to explore it more. Um, a question came, came in. In the Millennium Whole Earth Catalog, which is almost 30 years old, it states that there is not one national park dedicated exclusively to the preservation of grassland. The editor expressed hope this statement would become inaccurate. Um, is this now the case? Uh, 30 years ago, um, 
So there's one in Strong City. I'm trying to remember. Um, I don't have the date off the top of my head. It was right in the 1990s. In the 1990s, there was there was a burst uh, of uh, tall grass prairies. Uh, Neil Smith, the the prairie in Strong City, Kansas. That's a national park nature conservancy uh, project. Uh, there's a large tall grass prairie north of Pahuska in Oklahoma. Uh, that's a nature conservancy project. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of National Park Service, um, I think Strong City might be the only one off the top of my head that I can recall. A lot of states have them, and then the wild ref wildlife refuges have them, too. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out, what exactly happened in 1990, but I'm going to make note of that, um, that source saying that. So, so thank you for that question. Our next question, are there any connections between your area study and the global seed vault in the Arctic? There is. I mean, I've I've followed that the various um, what are they called the the seed banks. Um, I think there's a handful of them around. There is a connection, um, and and I don't want to go too far off on this tangent, but I mean the 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 prepper movement is something that I'm not going to bring up in my project. I don't think, but I, I search so much of this, like like heirloom seeds and what are seeds the algorithm on my YouTube channel, on my Facebook, gives me prepper commercials, prepper ads. Um, and, and so what I'm getting at there, the, the commonality is um, this, this notion that we can take seeds and keep them in the event of a crisis, right? And, and I think that's going on already. Some seeds are being used, just three, 400 year old seeds being used um, uh, to try to navigate through um, environmental change going on. I, I think that is already uh, a practice. Um, and what fascinates me too is um, this notion of, of having the seeds in a bank someplace. But um, one critique of that is, you know, seeds are, you know, yeah, they, they do have some, you know, fixed genetic material in them. But unless you plant them every year and then save them and know how to plant them, you know, if Armageddon comes uh, and you've never planted a garden before, you're probably not going to make it, right? <laughs> Just in, in all honesty, right? And so uh, it's fascinating to me, the, the, what I've read, my understanding of it is, uh, you know, those heirloom seeds um, were created at some point and they, you know, after... 30, 40, 50 years, as long as they run true, as they say, and maintain that heritage and their offspring, those seeds create the next uh, generation of plant that's uh, very similar to it. You know, even if you have the exact same heirloom seeds to start, if I plant them here in Fort Smith, Arkansas, someone plants them in Des Moines for 50 generations, they're going to be different, right? And so, um, I think the the seed banks and heirloom seeds are all fascinating. I think the the um, the open endedness to uh, the results of them I think is even more fascinating, right? And we tend not to think about that. We think of see this seed will give us this thing all the time, and um, the environment has a huge role in in shaping that, right? It's always kind of an open system. So, yeah, thank you for that question. And this will be your last question. And continuing to talk of seeds, what makes something an heirloom seed? Right. Yeah. So that that's um, a, a question that I've tried to pin down, and I think I, I at least have um, what people say. Right. The the responses that people have to it, and it's and it tends to be fifty years, a fifty year mark of um, you know fifty years ago, somebody cross pollinated you know, two different plants, and they created a hybrid, right? I mean, that is the act of domestication, artificial selection, human beings intentionally crossing a plant, right? So all our main plants and animals, you know, wheat, rice, corn, bovine, poultry, um, and swine, none of those plants and those animals exist without us creating them right we take we took wild variants of them and made those species and so um so yeah this like how do you get an heirloom seed how do you get an heirloom animal right because those those exist too um 
And so at some point, humans created this seed, this animal, this plant, and then, you know, kept on collecting the seeds, replanting. And, and again, that the running true, right, that, that first um, request that was sent out um, by the Wheatleys uh, to start, uh, it was called the True Seed Exchange, right? Do your seeds run true? Will they produce the, the same plant that you just got? Um, that is just wildly fascinating. And, um, and, and that's the, the short answer is 50 years, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it depends where you're planting it too, right? The, the environment, uh, can, can, uh, alter that as well. So again, it's pretty open-ended. I know I said we had our last question, but we had a question come in that I think is interesting. So if you don't mind, we'll, Sure. This will be our last sure. one. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So a question came in regarding your interaction with Meskwaki Nation. And they're wondering if anything was mentioned about their efforts at educating the future stewards and keepers of the seeds, like the children. Are the children directly involved in the uh, re-education of the seeds? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so I, I've visited uh, the Meskwaki settlement a uh, handful of times and spoken with people there and, and exchanged emails and given drafts of my paper to uh, members of the Meskwaki Nation. Um, and, and so I follow all of their social media as well. And uh, there are, and, and, and this is spoken to also in the longer hour long webinar series that, that Seed Savers conducted. Um, there are many programs, many, many programs of uh, teaching the younger generations and and the Meskwaki, like like so many other indigenous people, it involves food sovereignty. It involves linguistic sovereignty as well. Um, so yes, uh, I, I would say they're very active in younger generations as well as just bringing you know everybody into the process. Uh, so yes, yep, very impressive work that they're doing. Wonderful cultural work that they're doing. Perfect. And, and now, with that answer, we'll bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. And let's extend one last thank you to presenter Dan. We hope everyone will sign up for the future Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories to tell in the upcoming months, and we hope you can join us. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this very series or to watch recordings, check out our website, iowaculture.gov. And while you're there, you can look in some other fantastic digital programs we have, like our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on, for the next Iowa History 101 webinar on May 11th. Thank you all for joining us again today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.